Well, good morning. My message to you, the core of it today, is about courage. And it takes all I got to stand up here after watching those two videos because my emotions were touched deeply. When I saw that staff car drive up, And I remembered that Air Force staff car had driven to my parents' home in Commerce, Georgia, on the farm between Commerce and Athens, and brought that telegram and told them personally that I'd just been shot down the day before over North Vietnam. And I think it was a great reminder to us all that those back home suffer who don't go to war, and how much we need your support of the American people families, neighbors, friends. And so I thank you, Dr. Stanley, for having a program like this one today to remind us all of the power of us pulling together and the courage that's required. Because, see, my mom and dad had to have great courage to face the day and the next day because even though I made a radio call when I got on the ground, they didn't know for sure till about two years later that I was still alive. And they got their first letter from home at two and a half years. And I got my first letter at two and a half years in the POW camp. So the power of us working together and being a team and having unity amongst the families, not only the military people, but the families and the American citizens is essential. Because in unity, we have strength we can have a vision for our future and our freedom, and we can work together as a team to preserve it. And it's going to take that. Freedom is not easy, and it's not free. Well, I grew up on this farm plowing mules in North Georgia. Sorry, dirt. Working hard, but I also got to drive tractors, and I love to operate machinery a whole lot better than following that mule around. And what I always wanted to do from the time I was five years old was to fly airplanes. It was just something my parents took me down to the park in Athens, Georgia, and there was an old World War II fighter there. I climbed up on that old airplane, and five years old, I said, this is me. This is what I'm going to do in my life. And I never let go of that vision. And thankfully, my parents had the wisdom not to discourage me and allowed me to think about that and to pursue that in the days ahead. They did something else, though, that was very powerful for me, and that was they took me to church every Sunday, and they taught me the Bible, and we memorized Bible verses, and we prayed together. And what a foundation to have Christian parents who together were Christian leaders in our home. And my mother was more outspoken when she was a school teacher and a real powerhouse. There are not many people around her like her. And if you go to Commerce, Georgia, they can tell you about Ms. Ellis. And they'll probably say, well, she taught me or she taught my mama or my daddy. But my parents taught us how to pray and how to depend on God. And in those early days, I developed a worldview and an understanding of who I was and who God was and that relationship. And so at a very young age, I made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. And what really was in my heart was to honor God. I wanted to have wisdom, and I read the Bible a lot. And that was the greatest investment anyone could have ever given me. Because I did get to fly airplanes. Three days after I got my commission and graduated from the University of Georgia, I was in Valdosta in flight school. Fifty-three weeks later, I had my assignment to the F-4 Phantom Fighter Bomber, and the assignment said, F-4 Pipeline, Southeast Asia. This was August 1966. The war was building up, and it was time for me to go to war. And I headed off to Da Nang, which is in South Vietnam, about 100 miles south of the DMZ. One of the things that's critical was I really knew myself pretty well. I knew my passion. I knew my purpose. I felt God had called me to be where I was. He had given me a desire in my heart to do what I was doing and to do it well and to be a good soldier and to serve my country. I was a pretty adventurous, take charge kind of guy that liked to be in control. And what a great place to be is flying fighter airplanes. But there was a purpose and there was a war going on. 
And it didn't take long for me to accumulate 53 missions over North Vietnam and some over South Vietnam and Laos. And I worked in support of my Army buddies doing, uh, helping them out there, especially in the northern part of South Vietnam. I saw that sign on one of those videos that said Contien. I've been to Contien. I flew support there for the Army and Marines. And on that 53rd mission, my airplane was hit and it blew up. And fortunately, the cockpit stayed intact. And my partner, uh, there were two of us in this airplane. We were flipping around and all of a sudden we got positive G's in our seats. We pulled the handle. The airplane was no longer flying. Ejection seat worked perfectly. And the next thing I'm floating down in my parachute. We had great training, fabulous training that enabled me to know exactly what to do. My life wasn't flashing before my eyes. I wasn't worrying about dying. I was just doing my job and doing everything I could to put myself in the best position to evade the enemy and avoid capture. Unfortunately, I was captured within about 40 seconds after hitting the ground. No serious injuries, but all of a sudden I went from being this cocky, in control fighter pilot to being stripped of my undershorts in enemy hands, the communists, over their territory. And I was out of control. I'm so thankful I had, I knew that I wasn't in control, really. And over the next two weeks, I could, could not be more clear that God had a purpose for me in my life, and I really leaned hard on him. I had always done that, but now more than ever. Alone, in enemy hands, three times I was bombed by American air power because they didn't know Lee Ellis was down there. They were just trying to take out all those trucks on the roads. But we made it to foxholes and bomb shelters and didn't get hurt. But three times the local populace trying to kill me and my enemy, the staff sergeant who was in charge of taking, had the squad taking me up to, toward Hanoi, protected me. With their AK-47s, they pushed the crowds back. They threw me in the trucks, and it was like something in an old 1950s movie, you know. We made it out of town just before the crowd got us. And I arrived in the Hanoi Hilton two weeks later and was put in a cell six and a half by seven feet. That's six inches longer than that and a foot longer than that. About the size of a small bathroom. Well, it was our bathroom, not only for me, but for three others. So there were four of us in there for the next nine months in a six and a half by seven foot cell. We had six months of cabbage soup, a pumpkin soup, three months of cabbage soup, three months of sewer green soup, fed twice a day. We were always hungry, cold in the winter, hot in the summer. But the real fear was the interrogations and the threats of being tried as war criminals. And we were interrogated, and we were tortured, and we eventually gave something that was a nothing. Well, one of the great things about that situation was I had a senior ranking officer in my cell who was my leader, who was a New York State high school wrestling champion and a collegiate wrestler, and he was physically tough, mentally tough, and a person of great character. And when you're 24 years old and you can follow the footsteps of a 30-year-old who's that tough and is that significant of a leader, it makes life a lot easier. But also, he was a great leader, but he didn't know much about God, and he didn't know much about the Bible. And he started asking me, tell me, can you tell me about God? Can you tell me about the Bible? Because he hadn't been in church but five times in the last 25 years. And fortunately, I had some reservoir to draw from. But pretty quickly, I ran out, and I had to scratch and claw. And then he would come back around and say, can you tell me another Bible story? And I'd retell one I'd told a couple of months ago, you know. So I made a commitment then that I would always read the Bible more diligently than ever before when I came home, and I've kept that promise. Well, we also had another great leader who was an incredibly strong Christian, and that was Colonel Robbie Reisner. He was a senior ranking officer in the camp, and he put out some great cultural wisdom and guidance for us. He said, I'm in charge, and here's what I want you to do. Be a good American. Live by the code of conduct. Resist the enemy, take torture up to the point of physical or mental permanent damage. Give in, give as little as possible, and get ready to bounce back because they're coming after you again. Pray every day, go home proud. Out of that 
our mission, vision, and value statement came to be return with honor. Three words that covered it all. Return, we wanted to go home so badly, but it had to be with honor. We bounced back. We communicated. We tapped on the walls. We talked through the walls every way possible to support each other and pass the word. We passed Bible verses by tapping through the walls and memorized them. And they spread like that because everybody wanted to know about God in the POW camp. And unfortunately, they wouldn't love us a Bible. And those of us who knew him and knew the Bible somewhat, we ran out very quickly, way too quickly. And one day we came home. I was shot down 11 days after John McCain. We came home on the same airplane, March 14, 1973. We go back to Montgomery, Alabama about three days later. We had some work done in the Philippines where they checked us out. And then we came back. That was a great reunion with my family. And then back to Commerce, Georgia. I was single all those years. So I had uh, that to look forward to, meeting my wife, which I did about a year after I got back. And we've been married 38 and a half years. We have four grown children, six grandchildren. And what a wonderful blessing that they all know the Lord. So all of that to say, life has been very good to me. God has been very good to me. I knew from my young days that he had a purpose for me. And my job was to live and survive and to find out more about that purpose and then go live it and trust him in it. And that's always a challenge because every day is a challenge. Life's not easy. But it's the reality of our lives. Individually, I want to grow more Christ-like. There's no way to get there without suffering. I have to give up stuff I've been holding on to a long time and get freedom, not just from the chains and the prisons that I've been in. I've got to get freedom from old bad habits and learn new ones to grow, to be the person that God wants me to be, and it's painful. So suffering is the reality of life. And I want to add one more to that as I close. There is no honor without courage. You cannot honor God. You cannot honor your parents. You cannot honor your work, your leaders at work, without courage. And the thing that we most need in this country today is courage. Everybody's looking for the easy way out. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to take the courage challenge. The courage challenge is to lean into the pain of your fear to do what you know is right even when it doesn't feel safe or good or natural. Lean into the pain and go do what you know is right, and you will be blessed. We will be blessed. Our culture will be blessed. Parents will be blessed when they lean into the pain to do what they know is right for their family and their children. But leaders, leaders, we need leaders who will lean into the pain of their fear and have the courage to go do what's right. Courage, suffering, doesn't sound real good, does it? The blessings will flow out of it. Thank you all for your support of the men and women in uniform. <laughs>